Wally, uh, was there one uh, player who sort of keyed the comeback in that 42 series? Uh, well, I, I don't know because uh, it, 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 when I played it, the hockey was different. We were a lot closer. We, we played together, we saw each other a lot. And, uh, and you always, you always, if someone made a mistake, you always covered for them. And I, I can't see that in today's hockey. I don't think they have that. You know, the, the uh, it, it's completely different, uh, you know. The thing I don't understand is uh, they they fight like hell for uh, possession of the puck. The first thing they do is shoot it in the other zone. Now they they're throwing the puck away. Now they want it back again. I mean, <laughs> why don't they carry it over? No. Which we used to do. You carry the puck over. Well, Over the blue line. How important was Turk Broda in that series? Uh, he, he was a he was a great uh, yeah he was a great uh, uh, well one thing I I do want to mention is uh, we we this is like wartime hockey when uh, that was the season of 44, 45. Well, I I got there just about. 45 was going to just change and we had, well it was, uh, we had guys there that yeah, you can't remember or no one else can. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, in that respect it was, it, it was different, it was completely different. Yeah, that whole war time. You went to the uh, RCAF in uh, Winnipeg. Now, t tell the story. You wanted to become uh, a pilot, but uh, you couldn't. Yeah, well, uh, in '42, after the cup, uh, every uh, after we won the Stanley Cup, uh, we got our call to uh, join the army. So I. Uh, I wanted to be a pilot, so I went through the test there and discovered I was colorblind. So I, I failed the test there, and that's when I became a physical training instructor. And uh, I was stationed in uh, Trenton there, and, uh, and I was in. Yeah, well, in late 44, they were discharging uh, a lot of their personnel. Instead of all in one big swoop, they did it little by little, so there wouldn't be any congestion or hindrance. Now, Wally, did you feel that um, playing for the uh, Winnipeg team in the RCAF uh, I know it's not the NHL, but were you able to maintain your skill level? Because I know when you came back, half day was tough on you. Uh, no, it took a little while before I, yeah, because, you know, just playing for the RCA, you never really work that hard or you just got to take, take it easy, eh? Where if you're in the NHL, you got to play hard. So uh, that's the big difference. It took a little while for me to get back into, you, you could say, hockey shape. Now, uh, when you came back, the NHL had introduced the red line, meaning that before that you had to, uh, the defenseman pretty well had to carry the puck past the blue line, you couldn't pass it out. They put the red line in, and the theory was the defense could pass it all the way up to the red line, and then they dump it in and put pressure on the defenseman, yeah, yeah, uh, at the other end. Now, what did you think when you came back and saw this red line? 
Well, it, 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 of course, it speeded up the game, not skating-wise, but uh, in playing time, uh, because you, you're, the puck is moving so quickly now, and uh, I don't think we, uh, when we played, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't available then. Well, hell, I, I, uh, I still remember. And this is when I was just a kid, where you could not pass the puck forward. In other words, the puck had to be passed over, say the sentiment would have to pass the puck on a horizontal basis. If it, if it was uh, three or four feet before him, it, it, uh, they blew the whistle. Well, they changed that. They also they, they had some good uh, good rules too. Uh, you couldn't hit a player within four feet of the board, which they should adopt today. And that's uh, but then they got rid of that too. So uh, no. they, they started hitting everywhere. Well, uh, Milt Schmidt, uh, I asked him to appraise the defense from that era, especially the Toronto Maple Leaf guys, and he mentioned that you were the, uh, you were the best skater on the team. And, and, and Smythe, even uh, in your first training camp, at least he says, you know, look forward to this guy, he's like he's swiveled at the hips. You know, he can just, the legs get going and he mentioned that you were harder to knock down than uh, Joe Lewis, the boxer. Tell, first of all, how did you learn to skate so fast, and was that your best asset as, as a hockey player? Yeah, I, I, some of it is a, a natu natural, I guess. I had a good set of legs, because Spritz used to say, you got million dollar legs. So uh, I had the power in my legs, and also, uh, it, it depends on how you move your feet too. If their feet are too close together, you're not a good skater. If they're wider, you're a better skater. That gives you a little more push. When you throw your leg out, your right leg and then your left leg, and that's that's the difference. Now Wally, but, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, the year they didn't play me, uh, we were playing in Boston, and the Spice Flowers used to have his holidays uh, in Florida, and I always came back to Boston to see us play. Is a uh, at that time, we were, I forget the, the month anyway, but he always caught us in Boston. And I hadn't hit the ice yet that year. Well, see, that's when they, he benched me for half a season until uh, Bob Goldham uh, uh, broke his wrist. So he had to put me in. Well, this game in Boston, I was sitting on the bench, and Frankie Brunsek, the Boston goaltender, got a cut. Uh, 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 he stopped a, uh, a puck with his head. I, I, I don't remember where the cut was, but he had to go into the dressing room and get it stitched up. There was only one goaltender in those days, and of course, no mask. So there was nobody on the ice. All the players skated back to the bench and sat down. So had they said to me, I hadn't hit the ice yet, he says, Wally, get out and uh, get warmed up. So I said, what? I'm embarrassed. Nobody on the ice. So I just skated in front of the bench there, not, not too hard, just, and he kept yelling at me, get out, set our ice. He's, uh, and, uh, 
and uh, get warmed up there and he's yelling at me and so finally I skated out to the center ice and I made a little twirl on my skates and and the, the crowd so I went into a figure skating uh, style and the crowd loved it <laughs> so uh, uh, when I, I figured I was through I skated backwards, I raised one leg and I'm going backwards on one leg and, and the foot that was raised touched the boards, I knew where I was then. So uh, I turned around, I was looking for half day and I couldn't see him and then I, oh and there he was at the end of the bench laughing like hell. <laughs> And he had his head below the boards, so White wouldn't see him laughing. <laughs> so I think from that point on they called me the Whirling Dervish. I'm not sure. Now, uh, Wally, um, did Smythe ever, or uh, did Hap Day ever put the reins on you and say, "Look, Wally, don't go beyond the red line"? Did he ever try to? Oh, hold that, you they, back? They, they, yeah, they did that. Yeah, the, don't don't cross over. Yeah. Well, what would happen if you did? You like, did you obey the command or? Did well, you, just... that, you had to abide by his instructions. So, but that didn't last too long. Maybe a couple of games, maybe three games. That's about it. No. Yeah. After the forty-two cup, you won uh, three more: forty-five, forty-seven, forty-eight with the Leafs. Is there one of those Stanley Cups that was most satisfying than the others? Does one stand out in your memory, or? Uh, well, I, I, I guess in uh, 1942 when we came back that way, uh, we had surprised ourselves, but we we worked pretty hard. Pretty, now, pretty hard. Was there one specific leader on those that the team that won three consecutive Stanley Cups? Was it? Was well, there uh, one? Peter Kennedy was. Uh, he was our captain, when, and that was in the. Uh, that's wartime. But he was our captain, and uh, we beat Montreal, and we never should have, because they they had a, a an outstanding club. They uh, they had a lot of the uh, original personnel, and uh, I found out later they they were given supposedly jobs. So they wouldn't have to join the armed forces, and so they 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 had the team that, that should have beaten us. But Kennedy was pretty good on faceoffs, and uh, as a result, because of the faceoffs, we managed to uh, it just from the faceoffs in their zone. We scored we scored goals, and that's how we beat them. That was the 45 Stanley Cup? 44, 45, yeah. Um, let's talk about a couple of you. mentioned Ted Kennedy. Another captain you played for was uh, Sil Apps. Yeah. Uh, t talk to me about Sil Apps, the hockey player, and just the way he was around in the dressing room. And well, he, uh, yeah, yeah he, well, he was a real gentleman. Uh, uh, like, he, he wouldn't hit anybody. He was a good skater. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one one morning uh, he won the skating championship like the fastest skater. Well, I could have beaten him, but I just put a new pair of skates on. I didn't know this was coming off. Uh, I was second, but I could have easily beaten him. I think uh, I was the fastest skater. Uh, but with the new skates, it, it, it takes about uh, two or three weeks before you break in a brand new pair of skates, and that's what held me back. You know, you're not used to them. Yeah. Well, he Apps was the leader of the team, though. He was. He yeah. Was but him the he didn't. Uh, I'd say he was very quiet, a quiet type. Uh, he's a good hockey player. Yeah. Uh, who was the raw, raw guy in the dressing room? Who was the guy that just lifted the team? 
that go out? That lifted the team, like when you were down, or the guy that would come in and vocalize about, uh, you know, we got to do better, the raw, raw guy? I don't think, uh, that, well, the, the players didn't do that in those days. Uh, well, it was either half day uh, or even Spike used to come in the dressing room. And, and uh, it's about the size of it there because the players were usually, well, they weren't, you weren't supposed to say anything in those days. Now, in 47, uh, the fall of 47, Smythe made that big trade with Chicago when he got Max Bentley. Can you talk about Max, Mag, the Dipsy Doodle Dandy from the Lila David's call? I had to play against uh, when he was with Chicago. They had Bozienko, uh, Max, and Doug Bentley. And they were all small. And I had to start against them because I needed warming up a bit, you know. So they were like, <laughs> they were there and everywhere, you know, pass the park here, this and that. And then after a while, you know, you get used to it, but uh, when you first start, you're not warm enough to move and so on. Well, you know, move the right way and so on, yeah. They were they were tremendous uh, that that line. Now that when Max came to Toronto, you had uh, Apps, Kennedy, and Bentley as the centers. There was no other team that could match that. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Montreal, I guess, was because uh, they won a lot of cups uh, with the Rocket and so on. Now, uh, can you, a couple of other, this, this was later on in your time, police, but can you talk about the uh, Gold Dust Twins, uh, Gus Mortson and uh, Jimmy Thompson? What were they like? Well, uh, Thompson was always, he had the uh, uh, ability to put his stick in between a player's legs, right? And that's how he used to stop him. <laughs> Morton was, uh, he could carry the puck and, and so on, and he had a pretty good shot. Yeah. How about Bill Barocco? What did you think of Overrated. Him? Why yeah. do you say that? Well, I still remember uh, uh, we had a, uh, a supper you know all the all the hockey players and and uh, I happened to walk. We parked our cars and I was walking back with uh, Frank Bahovlich, and he says, "I'm going to uh, recommend that Bill Morelko Bill Morelko make make the uh, uh, Hall of Fame." I said, "What?" He says, "He doesn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame." He could skate that well. He could hit a bit. Uh, he got the winning goal, and that. And then, of course, he being lost eh, in the bush, uh, and that's maybe the reason why they Frank was going to recommend him. But he was he was overrated. Yeah. Uh, Wally, eventually you were traded to uh, the New York Rangers uh, following the 48 Stanley Cup and elsewhere you mentioned about uh, how you engineered the trade. Now when you got to New York there was a, a, a luncheon or a dinner held for you and uh, Phil Watson who was the coach of the New York Ro Rovers was also there. Uh, tell us what happened at that lunch. Well. Uh they asked me to say a few words, and I said I was very happy to uh, to be with the club, and I do my best there to help them, and uh, and so on, and uh, and then Watson came came grabbed a hold of the bike, and when I was finished, and, and he called me down. Which was a, a, 
you know, utter nonsense. I never did like him, and he didn't like me. So, uh, do, you, do you recall what he said to you? What did he say? Did you do you remember what he said? I I, I can't no I can't recall now, but he it was uh, derogatory, you know. It, 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 there was no place for him to to, to say anything outside of well, good luck to you, or but he never did say that. Yeah, any time I, uh, any time I walked, uh, I, 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 not walked. Any time I was on the ice, and once in a while, the bench would be right there on the same, on a face-off, and he's always calling me down. Eventually, I said, "Well, yeah. before you open your mouth, there, you better uh, learn how to speak English." That's what I told him. Now, um, you're now free from working for Conn Smythe. Now, I just want to get into your relationship with him a little bit. Uh, you seemed like a very carefree, easygoing guy. Do you think that sort of player drove Smythe nuts? Well, I, you know what surprised me was uh, uh, after I was, uh, well, I. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, was I? Yeah, I guess I was in uh, uh, Cincinnati then, because uh, uh, the year before I had so much trouble with my uh, with my knee here. It was a uh, cartilage, and I told you about uh, Yadikasawa just feeling with his fingers and and uh, saying that I. This is this is about two months now. I, I was off on crutches. That was the Japanese doctor, correct? Uh, yeah, Katasawa, Katasawa, and uh, uh, he put me in the hospital, and operated, and he made two small incision incisions on my knee, whereas. If you had a bad cartilage, they would really open you up like a big, big U, and fold all the skin back and expose the entire knee, and that was the problem. You'd be off over a month with that type of operation. But he only made two small incisions, and and cut cut out the broken cartilage and uh, he had me walking in three days I was skating in, in 10 or 11 days but by then I was not in the best of shape there to play and it, it was late in the season so I ne never did get back Five, got, got back and so that time uh, Rangers were in the playoffs, and uh, uh, they couldn't play on their own ice. They had to play elsewhere uh, because with the uh, old Madison Square Gardens, there was always some equi uh, some uh, something going on there. The dog show, the horse show. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, rodeo, fighting, the fights on Friday, basketball, every day was accounted for. They never expected the Rangers to be in the playoffs, so they had to play elsewhere. They never played on their own ice. Well, I was there, what, three years? And skated on on our own ice once. Uh, we always practiced on the third floor, which was uh, skating for for for, for people, uh, and uh, it wasn't a full size uh, ice surface. One corner was completely cut off. And uh, it was a terrible system there. 
Yeah. Now, Wally, you you um, uh, playing for New York, and was there a huge difference between playing for New York and, uh, as I uh, just mentioned, uh, getting away from Smythe? Was there like you seem to have a love hate relationship with Smythe? What What surprised me when I was uh, yeah, well, I was in Cincinnati then, and of course I, I'm back home. Uh, now the season's over, and uh, Smythe called me, and uh, oh, it really surprised me. He said, "I want you to coach Pittsburgh." That that was a fire club. He wanted me to coach Pittsburgh and offered me $5,000. Well, I tried to return the call a couple of times, but he was away and never got a hold of him. And uh, I talked to his secretary, tell Mr. Smythe that if he raises it to $7,000, i will take the job as a player and coach. Well, he didn't like that. I had to talk to him, so I never heard back from him. But I wasn't interested. I went to Cincinnati on age 65. Now, uh, with the Rangers, you played for, with some pretty uh, pretty skilled players. Can, can you talk about several guys? Uh, Buddy O'Connor, what was he like? Very small, very thin hockey player. Yeah, tried like hell. Yeah. How about Edgar Laprod? Yeah, he was a good, a good center, good playmaker, and so on. He just recently passed away. Yeah, I, I heard. How about Tony Leswick? Who's that? Tony Leswick. Well, he used to. Uh, <laughs> When we went, uh, usually we played in Montreal, and they uh, telling me they always beat Montreal, uh, which they did uh, on occasion. And uh, uh, he 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 would uh, skate next to the rocket and just follow him like a like a hound dog, <laughs> and always chattering and, and so on at him. And you get him out, get him a little bit annoyed. Yeah. Now uh, you also played with Fred Shearhol on the fence. Now, did you see the potential in him that he would become such a, a good coach? Uh, no, I no, I I I, I didn't think he'd. Uh, uh, well, he had a hidden talent, I guess. But uh, he he had the smarts. Now, Frank Boucher took over as coach in your second year with uh, New York, and that's the that's the year they went to the cup final against uh, Detroit, I believe. Uh, yeah. he, he must have had a big in impact on that Rangers team. Yeah, for, I like Frank. He was, uh, he was honest and uh, I'm knowledgeable. I, we, we, we take the trades, we, we'd always... Uh, We'd go into uh, into the washroom there, and probably out of a it was a fair size, like maybe three. On this one car, there was about you know about three faucets in there, so you could wash your hands of that, and that had a toilet in there too. So we used to congregate there after a, a game, and Frank came in one day. And someone said, Frank, tell us about your days in the, with the RCMP. He says, okay. Well, as it turned out, he was, he was a Mountie in northern Saskatchewan uh, in an isolated place there. Uh, nothing around for acres and acres. So he, he was on his horse one day and just making the rounds. And, he noticed his body on the ground. And so he said, Oh, look, he's there. I'm going to check this guy out. So 
he leaned on him, broke his uh, ribs, took the ribs, threw them back over the guy's face, and gave him, see, maybe he could get some knowledge out of what what had happened to him. And uh, one of the hockey players, I know, I know who it was, said to Frank, was he dead? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with the Rangers, you had the, that floating cartridge problem, which they misdiagnosed. And they sent you down to Cincinnati, Cincinnati for basically for recondition, reconditioning. Uh, yeah, because you're you're playing well, you're playing with the well with the Rangers, and there's there seemed no doubt they'd bring you back up. But um, when you first went down for a short time, your coach was King Clancy. Yeah, t he, uh, Clancy took over uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, and they won the cup really. But uh, when you went down, when you went down to Cincinnati, he was your coach there. Do you remember that? Him uh, Clint coaching? Smith. Clint Smith, you don't, so you don't remember with uh, King being... Clint, Clint Smith played with the Rangers and he was our, our coach there in Cincinnati. And uh, uh, he, uh, I found out later because he, uh, one day he arrived in, uh, in Toronto here and gave me a call and so I, I, I drove over there and I, and, uh, I picked him up and we, we made a few rounds here and there, but he told me that uh, that he could have the Rangers. I, I started with Cincinnati. I started getting my legs back, everything, and it took a little while because I was off so long. That's why they sent me there to get in hockey shape. So uh, he says. I could have sent you there a lot earlier, but I wanted to make the playoffs. Huh. And uh, we, the game we, we were playing was against uh, Indianapolis. And that's when I broke my leg. And uh, that finished my career. I wasn't supposed to uh, put any pressure on it. Uh, on, on my left foot, uh, I had a, small, a lot of small little breaks in the ankle, but the other two big bones were broken, and that's why I had the big cast out for six months, and a small cast for another three months, and that was the end of my career. Otherwise, if I'd have played more games, I probably would have made the Hall of Fame. I feel anyway because uh, uh, I was the one that was able to take the puck out of our own uh, zone and not get stopped. So the other club couldn't couldn't score. Now, Wally, there's a, a couple of interesting stories. After you you uh, broke your leg, you stayed in Cincinnati, and you lived with uh, Emil Francis. And uh, Ivan Irvin. Ivan Irvin. Yeah. Now there's there's a story that he Emil Francis told me a story where he put an exploding device in your car because you were you were you were egging them on that they had to stay in the night before a game and rest and you were making your way over to the pub because you didn't you didn't have to play and Ivan put a an exploding device in your car. I don't remember that don't one. Remember? No. 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 Yeah. How about the story? After though, after you, the season ended, you had a broken leg, and you instead of driving back to Toronto, you drove out to Vancouver. And what did you? How did you get the gas to go in your car? Uh, well, I I wasn't going to be uh, able to play, and my wife was in Vancouver. Her parents were there. They moved from Winnipeg, and they moved to Vancouver. So I thought, well. I may as well, I can't do anything here in Cincinnati, so I got in my car and the first day I was at, uh, unless I had 500 pounds of ice underneath the car, you know, that slushy type. So uh, I, my first stop there, I had to put the car in and get rid of that ice. 
and then I put some chainsaw on my back wheels and it's a good thing I did because the roads were pretty icy but eventually uh, the chains wore out and snapped so I get out of my car and I had to take them off and I'm on crutches. When I got out of the car I slipped and fell. It was it was it was that icy road. Anyway, I got the uh, I took it kind of easy there for a while. I I still remember one curve which was a downhill, and I had to make a right hand turn on, and I just made it. I landed up on the other side of the highway, but uh, fortunately there was nobody there. Did you use a hockey stick for the gas pedal? Yeah, yeah I couldn't put any. I said, can I put any pressure? Because they were all cars. You had to depress the clutch pedal. I said, can I use my leg? He says, no. So I said, well, oh. so I, 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 I got a hockey stick and I cut it. Just long enough that lay between my legs. And when I went to shift, I used my hand. And that, I, uh, the stick was attached to the clutch pedal. So I had to depress it by hand and then ch uh, change gears. And uh, the worst one was uh, when I was in San Francisco. We're going home, but we're going through California first, first of all. And in San Francisco, you know, the hills there. I made this right hand turn, all of a sudden I look and it's just, it's, it was so steep that halfway there, the car stalled out on me. Now there's a cabby behind me and I'm staying there and I got to move fast. He's blowing the horn. So, here I'm pressing it. I, the third time, before I could get the car moving, to just count out. I said, oh, this time I'll give it a bunch of gas, which I did, I got going again. Well, can you tell me the story about how you broke your uh, leg in uh, Cincinnati? Well, uh, uh, Pat Egan uh, uh, and I were the uh, experience, uh, experienced uh, players on the team on the uh, defense. The other was uh, 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 Ivan Irvin, but uh, uh, Cliff Smith always put an experienced player with a rookie, but that didn't work out too well with, with Egan and, uh, and his uh, teammate who was a, re a rookie. But they were scoring a lot of goals against them, and I, I could see what was happening there. So anyway, they, 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 Clint Smith decided to put Egan with me and the two rookies together, and uh, they started scoring goals against our our team. So uh, I I went. I talked to uh, Pat E. and I said, listen Pat, the policy is one defenseman always in front of the net. If it goes into your corner, you get it. If it goes into my corner, I'll get it. But here I am in my corner and who was shoving me to was Pat Egan. He should have been out in front of the net, just in case we didn't get possession of the puck. So I said, Pat, from now on, you stay in front of that net. If it goes into your corner, I'll get it. If it goes into my corner, I'll get it. I'll play both corners. And then they stopped scoring goals against us except that one time when it went into his corner and uh, 
I must have stepped on something, or maybe a penny, because people used to throw pennies on the ice. My feet gave away. When I broke the boards, and they're pretty heavy. That's how I broke my leg. And he could have sent me there. It could have sent me uh, back, and the Rangers wanted me back. But it never did happen. So. Wally, when you did retire, uh, how difficult was that when you left the game? When you retired, how difficult was that to leave the game? Well, I, I, I really missed hockey. I, I love the game so much. Well, in our time, I think you would have played for nothing. That's, you have to love the game in order to, uh, well, you, anything. If you don't like your job, you should get out of it. If you don't, if, if you don't like it, do something that you love. That I loved hockey. What did you do after hockey? What business did you go into? I sold uh, uh, heavy equipment, backhoes and earth movers of all kinds, cranes, and so on. Now you, you did spend some time with the Weston Dukes as a coach the Junior B team. What was that like? Yeah, Stafford twice I hired me. Yeah. Well, I coached uh, Bobby Nevin. He was with the, with the Dukes then. But Brant, uh, I think it was Brampton that beat us. Yeah, we didn't have the team there. Did you, in the early 60s, did you operate a uh, hockey school at all? Or did you, were you involved no, in a hockey no. school? Never operated a, a, a hockey school. No. Now, Wally, I understand you have a story about when you were with uh, Winnipeg in the uh, RCAF. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I can tell this story now because my wife passed away. She didn't like it at all. But while I was in the Air Force, I was going steady. And, uh, and eventually uh, I proposed. And we got married right on the uh, station. And. Uh, uh, it was getting on in, in time a little, and before we we planned on going towards somewhere around Kenora and renting a cabin and staying there for for a week. They they allowed me a week off. So I, uh, the Fort Gary Hotel, which was their, one of the nicer hotels, we stayed there. My wife and I and. Nobody knew that we got married. So we got on the elevator and uh, there was a, a Roy McBride who played with the RCA team. He was one of the uh, players. And uh, so he was uh, standing right beside me on the elevator. And, was my, and my wife was there. And, uh, Roy poked me in the ribs with his elbow and said, Wally, you got a good one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, just uh, some final questions. Um, who was the best centerman that you saw? Milt Schmidt of Boston. Yeah, he, he could do everything. Body check. Escape, pass. He had uh, all the all the good motions. Which goalie gave you fits? Which goalie gave you difficulty? Well, they were all pretty good. Yeah. Well, to take example, uh, Johnny Bauer. He couldn't make it. We only had one goaltender. Everything. Okay, who was the, who was the toughest, nastiest player on the ice? I tell you, Elmer Lockler, he, uh, he was kind of sneaky because uh, the puck would go over in my corner and I'd be in front of him and he'd poke my leg with his uh, stick 
and throw me off balance and I'd go sliding in and he came out with a putt. Which road city did you like playing in the most? Well, I don't know, well, Chicago was, uh, I, I still remember Chicago because they, uh, they used to have a basketball game uh, on Sunday mornings and we'd play there Sundays. And the ice wasn't thick enough and if you took a sharp curve there you'd, you'd be spraying bits of ice and there, there was the concrete showing. Eventually they had to put a stop to it because it was too dangerous. What was the best forward line you played against? A complete unit. I think you mentioned the pony line previously. No, what? The pony line. Uh, but who, who, what was the uh, forward line that gave Well, I, I, the, the, the Bentley boys were, were great. Well, of course, so, so was uh, the... Uh, uh, so was the... Uh, uh, the rocket there and, and uh, Locke and Tove Lake. Uh, well, the Boston, of course, had uh, the Schmidt and the Bauer and Bauer and the, yeah, they were all good lines. What was the refereeing like back then? Well, they were uh, they weren't the. Uh, we had fights in those days, but not like uh, today's hockey. They, they, the, the, uh, he makes a team because he's a good fighter. A bad hockey player, but a good fighter. Uh, did you have any dealings with Clarence Campbell? No. No deal with uh, Clarence Campbell, no. Were you a f Nobody did actually. No players anyway. Were you a physical player? Did you get into a lot of fights? Uh, no, I didn't get into a lot. I had a few, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, I did. Uh, the one I remember is uh, uh, I was with New York then. And uh, we, we were penalized and. Uh, and so I said, there's only a few minutes left to play. And we were ahead. So I, know, well, I skated out there. And I started a fight with, with a guy. See, we, we, we'd, uh, you can't have more than two people. So when I started the fight with this guy, he got off and I got off. So, uh, so they had the same amount of players as, as we did. Um, but you can only do that when it's at the end of a game. Now you you were a clothes horse during your times with Lease. You like you were stuff very stylish. In your I dress was, yeah. yeah. How I, did that all come about? I don't know. I just. Uh, I just love, love to address it then, in those days, yeah. Cause you and of course, with the leaves there, you always had a tie and so on. So Wally, can you tell me about what's on the, uh, what's on the wall there? Well, there's a picture of the New York Rangers when I played there. What, what season is that one? Pardon me? What season? Uh, that was in... Uh, uh, 49, maybe, or 50 or 51. Okay, all right. And what's the other picture then beside it? Is that you playing? Uh, uh, that's me in, in, uh, in front. Charlie Rayner is in the net there, and uh, that's me there on, on the left. And Charlie Rayner was a pretty good goalie to play for? Oh, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No mask. No, well, nobody wore a mask in those days, right? <laughs> and uh, I, me I remember he, well, he got a little puck shot once. He, he stopped the puck with his face, eh? and for a while anyway, you know, he, 
It was instilled it's still in his memory. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other pictures have you playing for the Leafs. Now, where did you get this one? And uh, that, the one with the Leafs was uh, this is a le uh, the one on the right is the uh, a little uh, older. That's when I first broke in. So it had to be uh, uh, 1939. That picture was taken. Now, did the lease give you that? It says Maple Leaf Gardens Memories and Dreams. Was that from the lease itself, or was that something that came from uh, another company? Uh, I forget where I got that one now. Okay. Yeah. It's a neat picture, though. You look so young. What are you, about 19 in that picture? Yeah, yeah just about, yeah. Well, this is a very interesting picture here. Uh, can you tell me where you got it from, or...? Well, my mother uh, uh, saved this uh, calendar, and I had all 12 uh, months of it. But this one I, uh, I kept for myself because it was 1941, and that's the year I, I made the Ulster team. And uh, I'm the only one living in this, in this photo here. Now, that brings me to this point. You are the oldest living former Toronto Maple Leaf player. I am. What does that feel like? Feels like I'm old. <laughs> yeah. What's what's your what's your fondest memory from hockey? Well, making the NHL, which was I think every kid that's interested anyway. Uh, making the National Hockey League. In, the, in, in those days, it was pretty tough to make it because it's, there's only six teams and the players were, you know, they're limited. Uh, back here is a picture of, uh, of our uh, junior team and we had uh, uh, Two forward lines, which is six people, two defensemen, that's eight, one goaltender, nine, and we had ten players, one spare. And Bert uh, uh, Janky, my uh, defense partner, we both played 60 minutes. He was the captain of the team, right? He was the captain of the uh, I don't think we had anything like that, like a capital team. We were a great group there because we were so close. Wally, I just want to thank you for taking the time to meet with us, and we appreciate all your stories and uh, about your wonderful career. I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Paul Bruno, the president of uh, Sir. Thank yeah. you. Well, on behalf of Sir, the Society for International Hockey Research, I want to thank you for making history with our group today, being the first entry into our oral history of hockey. Good, good to make it. Thank you very yeah. much. And on behalf of the group, I want to present you with a copy of our hockey research journal. Oh yeah. And a Sir pin for our hockey society. Oh yeah. That's for yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.